here we go. DeAndre Bonds, welcome to Vlad TV. Man, thank you for having me. Yeah, man, I actually wanted to do this interview like five years ago. We quickly ran into each other. Oh, yeah. But, you know, I think you had other things going on at the time, so it didn't happen then, but it's happening now, and I think it's actually a better time for yeah, it to I be happening so now. I think so, too. Yeah, I'm, I'm in a better place now. Yeah, man. And, you know, I've seen you in a bunch of newer projects, and we'll, we'll talk about that yeah, when absolutely. we get to that. But congrats on, you know, not only having, you know, parts of legendary movies, but also continuing to get absolutely. dope parts and, and to keep perfecting your craft, man. Yes, sir. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. I've been in it for a minute. You know, this is my passion. Yep. And uh, I don't see me ever stopping, you know, whether it's in front of the camera or behind, I'm going to have something to do with this. No doubt, man. Well, let's start from the beginning. You grew up in L.A. Yes, sir. What part? South Central Los Angeles. Um, um, I grew up in um, like 80th and Avalon um, on the east side in the Swans. Everybody, you know, probably know about that. And um, I grew up in the Hoovers. I went to uh, 52nd Street Elementary, went to John Muir Middle School. I stayed in Compton for a minute on Atlantic Drive, went to Whaley, Roosevelt. So, you know, I kind of touched every aspect of L.A., you know, from Compton and Watts, Inglewood, you know, I was born in Sentinella Hospital, so, yeah. And I guess your father left early uh, on. Yeah, early on, you know, my father and my mother had, you know, their, their personal issues, which caused them to separate. However, my mother, you know, raised me, and, um, you know, she did what she had to do. What was the last time you seen your father? My, fa my father is resting. He's pa he passed away in 2005. And um, the last time I saw him was 2001, probably, okay. yeah, in so, court. <laughs> in court? Yeah. For what? That's another story. Okay, fair enough. So you guys didn't really have a relationship? Um, not one that I could have, uh, that I wanted or that I would love to have had with him. However, we, I knew my father. My father knew me. I spent time with him. He saw my career progressing and got to enjoy some of that with me. And, um, you know, the, the parts and what I needed from my father, I, I believe in my heart, I received at the time I needed it. So, you know, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm sorry for your loss. Yeah. You know, you're yeah. still a fairly young man. Yes, and, sir. You know, Thank you know, it's sad that you lost your father so early. Yeah. Uh, well, he's inside of me, so, you know, yeah. he just... Well, uh, you're the oldest of six children? Yes, I have um, five sisters and two brothers, so I'm actually the oldest of uh, eight. Oldest of eight? Well, seven siblings plus me, so. Okay, yeah. and I guess your mother had children with, I guess, six, six different well, men? Well, yeah, my mother has, uh, growing up in the time she grew up in, in the area that she grew up in, you know, it was, it was different. You know, she had issues that she had to, you know, deal with and a lot of my people, a lot of people in general in this time were dealing with, you know, just the crack epi epidemic in that time. So my mother struggled with that. And, you know, she didn't live a life that she does now. She's been clean and sober for 30 years. Congrats. And she's, uh, she's absolutely wonderful now and great. However, yeah, you know, it didn't start off that way. We had to go through a lot of struggles and However, we conquered our, 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 whatever we had to, you know, endure, we went through it and we conquered it. Yeah, I, well, I, I have people close to me that grew up yeah. with, with drug addicted mothers. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they describe just, uh, you know, coming home when the lights are out, off yeah. and uh, all your stuff is in the front lawn because you've been evicted. And then through it all, uh, sleeping in cars, man, uh, other people helping us, you know, uh, being without. <laughs> living on noodles and, you know, but, you know, a lot of people at that time, especially my people, were going through the same thing. So, you know, it was just a part of the, 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 the demons that my people had to struggle against, you know, and the, the, the powers that be. Well, yeah, I mean, you're talking about, I mean, because you were born in 76. Yeah, 76. You're, you're... 10 years old in the middle of the crack Everything. epidemic. Yeah. Like literally when it's starting to hit LA is when you're a, a very young man, yes, you know, still, still a boy at that point, not even a teenager. 
and you're growing up in this environment. So what was it like, you know, with all your siblings having different fathers? How, how what was that like exactly? Well, it 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 was um we were siblings still, you know, um yeah. none of the men that my mother associated with at that time what was um involved in our life, you know what I mean? And that's none that's, of them at all, none, none of your none. Really? And you know that's that's uh sad and unfortunate. However, we had one another and that made us a uh, uh, stronger um a unit, you know what I mean? We we that's all we needed was one another and our mother was our rock, so it was like it opened my eyes and gave me a um a more understanding that I had to be the man at an early age because we needed what we needed and I was the only one that was able, you know, and the oldest to get out there and make it happen. So I used to pump gas, I sold candy, and I made um, ends meet to provide for my family and help my mother in her time when she needed help and my family, which any man would do. I mean, so, you're the oldest out of, well, eight kids, I guess. Yes, sir. So with, with none of the man, none of the fathers around, yes, you were becoming the man of the house when you're really not a man yet. No, sir. It's, not, it's a really. very unfair situation for for you know someone that age. Yeah, it is. However, um, I was equipped. You know, God blessed me to be able to do what I needed to do. And a lot of my people, like I say, I'm not the only one that has has had to do this. Step up at an early age and become or be the man that you know, our parents, our mothers needed us to be, our sisters, our, or our siblings needed us, you know? So, yeah. Well, I guess at one point you ended up in foster care? I was in foster home, group homes. Um, that's the, at the time my mother um, decided to check herself in the rehab and get her life right so she can get us, you know, all back because one of my family members at the time they had uh, found some drugs in his system and they wind up taking us from my mother and she made the conscious decision to get her life right and she got her life right. It took her maybe a year and maybe two years almost, but she got all of us back and <laughs> she's been clean and sober ever since and she's a, a great rock to our family and to uh, our community, you know. Well, I've heard horror stories about foster homes. Yeah. How, how bad was that for you? Well, I was in um, the foster home. It was it, it was actually, it was not as bad as, I think it was me and my rebelliousness not wanting to be there. But the people that I was, um, that was responsible for my care, I had uh, some exceptional people that really cared about me. Made sure I was uh, going to school and, you know, but I still acted out and they wind, they wind up having to let me go. So I wind up going to, um, a youth center, a Long Beach youth home, and um, it was a 40-man group home, and that was that was a little more active, you know what I mean? Like first day or two, it's we fighting, and you know everybody running around. It's all boys, teenagers, so a lot of testosterone and young minds. So you can imagine. Well, all, all boys that are coming from broken families. Absolutely. Not, you yeah. know what I'm saying? So you, Every, have, yeah. you have these situations where there, there's anger and resentment and yes. feelings of abandonment. And now you're with a All bunch of other kids yeah. in the same so situation it, yeah. as you. It's rough. So that was just fighting nonstop? Uh, not nonstop, but... But a lot. A lot. But yeah. it was also a lot of fun. You know, we went out, we got to learn one another and, you, you, you know, camaraderie and how to, they had um, field trips and things we went on. It, it was, it had its ups and downs. Well, you're growing up in LA during this time and it's essentially these different areas are, are gang areas. Yeah. I mean, cause you know, you were selling candy and hustling that way, but were you getting involved in any of the street shit at all? Uh, abs straightforward, no, you know. I had my issues as far as, um, having people, you know, press me or, you know, try to get me to become a part of their gang. However, you know, that's something that I never did and I never wanted to do. I had my dreams at an early age. I wanted to be in movies. So that was what I was focused on, you know, how to get there, how to achieve this. I had no idea. 
So in the meantime, and in the between time, to keep me f away from the gangs and drugs, I sold candy. So I used to catch the bus from um, my home on 80th and Avalon, downtown Hollywood, and that's how I hustled. And that's how I ultimately met my agent trying to sell her some candy. So it was like I was on the right path and I got one of my dreams answered because I was doing the right things and not dabbling and, you know, gang banging and trying to rob and take shit from other people. You know, I can go get it myself. That's just how I felt all the time. I mean, that's a very strong will right there because you know, what you were making selling candy dudes was probably flipping that, making that, you now, know, was, 20 I minutes. I was making like, maybe $150 a day selling candy from uh, 13 to 16, 17, okay. yeah. And you met your agent. And I met my agent. And, okay. um, and at that point, did you have any acting experience at all? No, I never had any acting classes or, uh, I was just something that I always wanted to do and I had a passion to do it and just growing up, you know what I mean? Like experiencing the things that I had to at a year, early age and in my, in my life, it I was equipped with the, uh, the emotions and the, you know, that what you need to express, you know, oneself as an actor. So I've been through all that shit. So it's like. Well, I guess at 13, you were in a play. I was and in you a play played, uh, I guess, a drug addict. A drug, <laughs> yeah. In a play. In a play, a teenage drug addict and, you know, uh, it was my first experience and I loved it. Everybody afterwards was clapping, they were giving me money and <laughs> I just, I got bit by that bug and it was like, you know, I could see it happening. Right, so at that point you're like, all right, this yeah, is what I I'm wanted, doing. I period. Nothing you know, could fuck stop all me. this extra shit. I have a tunnel vision straight to this. To this. Movie shit. Okay, so I guess a bunch of interesting stuff happened while you were selling candy. Apart from actually meeting your agent, yeah. What else? I met I met a, everybody, man. From ooh, Martin Lawrence, uh, Tupac, man. I met Tupac, man. Selling uh, candy, Scarface, selling candy, yeah. Chub Rock. Uh, oh my goodness, Ice Cube, uh, man. Whoever was somebody at that time, and being in sun, being in Hollywood. And just, you know, that I ran up and down uh, Sunset Boulevard. That was my, that was where all the money was. Huh. Comedy store, the old. Yeah. So that's why well, I frequented that. So I met a lot of people and I, you know, had some ins expiring experiences and some, you know, negative ones as well. However, yeah, that's right place at though, the man. right time. That's, that's very inspirational. Yes, sir. You know, like. Just I met uh, Martin Lawrence. Um, I was out in front of the comedy store, and uh, this was I'm like maybe 16. And um, I see Martin coming. I got about 20, 20, uh, maybe forty dollars worth of candy left. And I'm, I'm like, I'm excited because every time you see somebody famous, a musician, an actor, you just know they're gonna help you out, you know. So right. Martin came. He didn't want no candy. But he bought, gave me a hundred dollars. Was like, man, resell the candy, but thank you. And you know, I was like, oh, I'm done. I don't, you know, I don't really have to do nothing no more. So I'm sitting out there. About five minutes later, the bouncer comes out, and I'm thinking, oh man, I gotta go. He about to tell me to get a body, and he actually invited me in. So I'm tripping and invite me in, set me down, gave me a seven up in the back while Martin's performing on the stage. Martin sent him to invite me in. And man, I was just so ecstatic, man. Like, and the brother um, performed. I watched him perform, and afterwards, when he was done, he told everybody, "It's my little funny-looking boy back here, little candy seller. So Y'all go out there and get him. He got." And I had a line of people, man. <laughs> and I didn't have enough candy. I sold out so fast. They were just giving me money. I was like, "Oh!" And that was just one of the most inspirational experiences that I had with one of my, um, you know, my my childhood heroes, you know what I mean? I grew up on Martin, bro. And then to, yeah. to experience that type of, uh, yeah, thank you, Martin, man. I love you, brother, man. One of the most inspirational um, people in my life, man. Thank you, I appreciate you. So you have an agent and you start getting some TV roles. That's yeah. how you started, right? Yes, sir. I, um, my first role was South of Sunset with Aerie Spears. It was a speaking part. 
And this was actually my first audition I ever went on. My, I, I got a, um, I booked it. And um, man, it was just a wonderful experience. The most money I ever made in no time. So I was like, yeah, this is, this is it for me. Okay. So what happened after that TV uh, appearance? Well, you know, I started, I booked Tales from the Hood. That was my first movie. That was your first movie. Yeah. I remember, I, remember I see, I, I watched it at the theaters. Yeah, Tales so from the Hood. Yeah, it was a cult classic. Rusty Condiff and um, executive produced by Spike Lee. And, you know, it had um, a, a lot of people in there. It's a cult classic. If you say, as you say, yeah. a lot of people love that. Yeah. Well, my I mean, first movie. I mean, you didn't see like black horror films coming out during that time, like yeah. really at all. Except the, you know, I mean, you see what Jordan Peele's doing yeah, now. Yeah, 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 yeah. Back Tales then, Tales from the Hood was back then. Yes, yeah, sir. Um, okay, then, you know, Sunset, uh, Sunset Park, Get on the Bus. I booked. I just started booking movies, man. Lockdown, Three Strikes. You know, I did The Wood. Well, then The Wood came yeah, out. Yeah, The Wood. Well, was The Wood kind of your big one? That was the one that um, was one of the ones that like helped me. More people recognize the character I played Stacy from the wood than uh, any other movie that I made. It's like they literally called me Stacy, Stacy, Stacy. Like <laughs> I might as well. I think I am. I'm gonna change my name to Stacy, man. <laughs> Well, I mean, it just had some classic parts in it. Yeah, yeah. Like, you know, my brother's coming after school, he's going to fuck you up. Yeah, real <laughs> Then here you show up. Like, Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, and it was, a, that's how it was back in in that time, in that era, you know. And, you know, a lot of people um, either lived through that or had the chance to experience that. You know, like, the generation now, um, um, they recognize me and I, you know, I'm talking about 20, 20 year olds. They like, I'm like, how you know me? How you know me and Stacy from a movie? That's the movie about 20, you know what I mean? Older but, than you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. No, that, that was a great one, man. And it just, uh, you know, I guess it sort of showed how you could be enemies with someone one day and friends with them the next yeah. day. And yeah. you, you know, it just shows the, the dynamics of it. It was part of like growing up and yeah. being an older brother, you know, you're not gonna be able to keep your sister from every man, you know what I mean? <laughs> One day she gonna, so you would want it to be somebody that genuinely appreciates and cares for her. So my character seen that in uh, Lil Mike, in Big Mike, you know, where he played, he was Lil Mike, but I called him Big Mike. And so that that's kind of how I fed off of that, me having a little sister I would want somebody that really appreciated her. Like Lil Mike showed, he really liked my uh, the, uh, Melinda Williams' character. So, you know, that's all it was. Alicia, yeah. But, uh, well, I mean, here you are, and you know, you started doing a bunch of movies. Um, you know, I mean, you mentioned Sunset Park, Tales from mm -hmm. the Hood, Get on the Bus, The Wood, and then there's also Three Strikes. Yes, sir, Three Strikes, uh, DJ Pooh. Yeah. You know? Yeah, DJ Pooh. Yeah, that's one of it. Uh, you know, who co wrote Friday. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Lockdown, Master P. Yeah, Master P, shout out, real life. So, I mean, here you are, someone who didn't come up as a trained actor, mm -hmm. but now you're getting all these roles and you're working with some of the finest minds in Hollywood, the Spike Lees and so forth. What was that really like? At that time, man, it was unbelievable. It was like I was actually achieving what I set out to do and experiencing it in a in a way that I didn't imagine I would. Like, you know, with all the like big names and these big people that I grew up admiring, you know what I mean? Now I'm working with them and it was just like, man, unbelievable. But it was also inspirational, you know what I mean? I got a little cocky at that time. Being young, I'm, you know, making some money, I'm traveling, and I'm I'm feeling myself. And um, you know, I had a a, a a a little, you know, I had to be set down and brought back down to earth, so I had some issues. Well, I mean, you're getting these roles, but I mean, is it safe to say you were being typecast? Um, You're always yes, kind of the tough guy, yes, yes. you know, the street guy. Yeah, I, I think it's safe to say that. However, you know, if that's what uh, 
if that's what you see, if that's what you paying me, and that's what y'all admiring, and people yeah. loving, typecast me, fuck it. Do you think that, you know, as you're getting these types of roles and you're becoming known for these mm -hmm. types of roles, you start adopting these characters into your own personal life? You know how Tupac... You say what, you manifest... Yeah, uh, you know how Tupac played in Juice, and I feel like he kept that Bishop character... Going on. Going on. I've, I've heard that before from, from a lot of people. Do you think that you were start taking on Life these characters? Life imitating art. Um, yeah. I think it's a lot of um, truth in that as far as with anybody, not only just actors, just in any part of your life, whatever you, 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 you know what I mean? It's, um, it's like when I did Three Strikes, I got shot in the ass in Three Strikes, my character did. However, after I did that movie, in reality, I wound up getting shot three times, and one of them was in my ass, the bullet. And it was kind of like, damn. Then I did Lockdown. And I, uh, in, that, um, in that movie, the character I played, one of, um, he wound up going to prison for um, defending his life. Well, he was wrongly convicted, but he wound up having to stab somebody while he was in prison to defend his, his life. And then in reality, um, I wound up going to prison for manslaughter. So it yeah. happened after that. And, um, yeah. and we'll, we'll, I, I want to talk about all that yeah. a little bit more in depth. Um, what you said, you know, as you were building up and getting all these roles, you said, uh, I thought I was Tupac, man. I felt like I was thug life. I thought I was basically on top of the world. I wasn't. Was that, so you were feeling like Tupac at that well, time? Well, you know, at that time, Tupac was who everybody was loving, right. who was speaking for my generation, the things that we couldn't say, or we didn't know how to say it. And, um, you know, I, 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 I was feeling like I was a thug, you know what I mean? And um, I'm, I'm not ashamed to say that. You know, I wasn't no gang member or nothing, but I feel like, you know, it's like the, What's this new generation? And they not gang members, like housing. Remember how we was housers or taggers? And when we was coming up, we wasn't gang members, but we had something like, yeah, so. That's, I felt like that. Yeah, man, I'm feeling myself at that time. I was not, I was young, I was naive. I wasn't as knowledgeable uh, about myself as I am now, you know? And I didn't have too many people to guide me or to look up two, four guidance, or for direction, you know, because I really had a gang of people that was just around me for, you know, the negative reasons, you know, yeah. wasn't for the positive, you know, really because they genuinely loved me. A chosen few were, but for the most part. So were you married at that time? I got married afterwards, after I went to, um, I got married in the county jail. In the county jail? Yeah. Okay, so was that after before my before the shooting or no? Um, well, the shooting happened before. Okay, so let's talk about that. All right. So, I guess you're about to start shooting lockdown. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. And a couple of days before, I get uh, well. It wasn't a couple of days before. It was a few months before. A few months before. Yeah. You get shot. I get shot. Can you talk about what happened? I was uh, just at my uncle's house, and um, I guess you sat at the wrong place at the wrong time. Guys rolled by, threw up some gang signs. I was standing in the front yard. I didn't throw no gang signs back up. They left. A few minutes later, they came back, got out, chased me down, and shot me. Just a completely random just completely, neighborhood I mean, that, situation. That was, that was a how things were at that time. I, um, in my community in South Central LA, a lot of people got shot that wasn't doing nothing, man. You know what I mean? I, it's, it's sad, but it's true. You didn't have to bang. You could just be in the wrong place in an in a area, and they think you from that gang because you're in that area. Or you could be just standing out somewhere at a bus stop or you know, people ride by and, you know, they looking for it, uh, trouble. So it's like, I just was a victim. Uh, Where'd you get hit? I got hit two times in my leg, one time in my thigh. Bullet went um, un out and came, got stuck in my, um, in my ass. And it came out about 13 years later. 
So you were basically got a bullet in you for 13 years. Yeah. Yep. And it pushed it where it came out. They say he, the doctor told me it's going to come out one day. They don't know when, but anything um, foreign in your body, your body tends to, um, you know, try to get it out of the straight. And that was the first time. And that was the first time you got shot. Yes, sir. That was the first okay. Time got so shot. you got rushed to the hospital. Rushed to the hospital. But but it wasn't life threatening. No, I got out the same day. Thank okay. God. Okay. Did you ever go back in the area again? Um, my uncles. Yeah. No. So that was it. No. <laughs> Uh, I didn't go back. I don't blame you. No. So then you, you get shot and you, you're doing lockdown. Yeah. And I uh, had to go on set and let them know, you know, I just got shot. So I had a limp and I'll kind of work through that and got the job done. Well, there was a, you know, and because this kind of leads me into, into mm -hmm. one of the scenes in lockdown. I guess there was a situation that happened with your wife. As far as what? Well, I guess you were, um, you pled guilty to battery of a spouse. Mm, um, that wasn't my wife. Oh, that was no. girlfriend. That was something when I was 17. Oh, okay. Yeah. Can you talk about that at all? Well, I mean, I just had a girlfriend and we lived together at the time. And I came home with some phone numbers in my pocket. She found them, got, got mad, and uh, we got into an argument. And um, I wind up getting accused of putting my hands on her and some other shit that wasn't true. And I had to plead no contest in order to get everything taken care of. But this was my living girlfriend. We had shared apartment together. She had my name tattooed on her and I had my, her name tattooed on me and just some, you know, bullshit going on. That's all. Well, uh, Lockdown had a rape scene mm -hmm. that, that you were in, mm -hmm. and um, I guess you didn't want to do it. The 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 rape scene? Yeah. No, I did not want to do it. I, that's one of the worst scenes I ever did, and I wish I could go back and take it back. You know what I mean? But you know, I was an actor. I'm an actor at the time, and the director, you know, said you. I need you to do this, man, you know, and like, fuck it, come on, man, let's just get it out the way. I guess you cried after yeah, doing that scene. Yeah, I cried. Literally, like, because I felt like I, I didn't feel right, you know what I mean? It was just something that wasn't spiritually right about that shit. And I didn't see what it needed to be in the movie for. But, you know, I wasn't the writer of the movie, and I agreed I was under contract. Yeah, I guess as an actor, you can't just start changing the script. No, nah, you can't. Not once you sign. Yeah. But yeah, that was one of the. You know, you were you were doing films. I guess a little bit after Tupac, I guess was was doing. Films, mm, was a little bit after. A little bit after. Were yeah. you running into Tupac at all on the acting side of things? Only one time after I met him on Sunset, um, I ran into him at the premiere of Sunset Park which he had um, a song on the soundtrack, High Till I Die. And I met him at the premiere and he was just a wonderful person, man. I, that was one of my, my idols. I mean, if I could say that, I'm not supposed to have idols. He was one of my mentors, someone I looked up to and I admired. Oh greatly. yeah, man. I mean, imagine what Tupac could have done acting wise had he stayed, you know, on, on this planet, because I, I had heard, I forgot who told me, but someone told me that he was actually, had been cast for Will Smith's role in Independence Day. Wow, it's not yeah. not unbelievable. The brother had limitless yeah. talent. Like, anything. and then he died, and then Will Smith ended up getting the role, and then that wow. was the role that took Will Smith, yeah, you know, next. into a, turned him into a movie star. He was Absolutely. a TV star already, and he became boom, a movie star, yeah, he yeah. took off. Yeah, great too, um, man. It's, uh, yeah, I just interviewed Bill Duke. Wow. And uh, he talked about how him and Tupac were meeting and talking about doing film projects because he's a director as well. Absolutely. You know, he did Deep Cover and Deep a bunch cover, of other. Yeah, Bill Duke. Have you actually met Tupac when he was alive? Yes. You did? Yes. What was the inter uh, interactions like? We wanted to, this is not, this is 
not too long before his death, we, we wanted to work on some films together. Aha. And um, he talked about his belief systems, you know. He talked about our community. He talked about this country and the world. He, he was a brilliant young man and courageous in a lot of ways. Okay, so he wanted to work on films with you. Okay. So, so Pac would have been, you know. Amazing, bro. He could even, have been Michael B. Jordan, basically. I mean. Even bigger. He, yeah, he's like in a class all by himself, bro. Always has been. He was just a, a, a <sighs> yeah, sad. unbelievable. So a situation happened with your aunt's uh, boyfriend. Yeah. Can you talk about that? Well, you know, I um, got into a, a altercation um, that was unprovoked by myself um, with my aunt's boyfriend at, in 2001. I just booked a movie, got hired by Denzel Washington to play in um, Antoine Fisher. I was having f I was excited, you know, I'm two weeks away from, you know, filming basically. And I go to my auntie house always, check on my family, give them, you know, a little money. And this day, uh, her boyfriend, I guess he was having a bad time in his life. And I pulled up and playing loud music, triggered something in him. He came and he attacked me and with no words or nothing, just I defended myself, couldn't win. And um, wind up pulling a knife and just getting a, um, stabbed him one time and he died. Stayed there trying to help him, waited for the ambulance and he lost his life. And I uh, ended up getting convicted and went to trial and got manslaughter. The jury found me guilty of manslaughter. Cause so, so he attacks you and you pull out a knife, self-defense, no. and then he basically runs into the knife? Well, no, he didn't run into the knife. Um, when I pulled up and he was attacking me and I'm trying to defend myself, I couldn't get him, you know what I mean? So I ran in the house and I grabbed a knife. When I came back out, he came at me again. And this time when he approached me and he swung, I, I uh, stuck, stuck the, knife, stuck the knife out and he got hit in the chest. And uh, he knocked me down again, he was standing over me. And about, he started, you know, he didn't know he was stabbed. I didn't even know he was stabbed until I seen him. I looked up and I seen a line on his chest and I seen him, you know, he was walking around and he started grabbing the gate and shaking it. Then he turned around and I walked up to him and he sat down. I told somebody to grab the water hose. I tried to run water on him and called the ambulance. Somebody called the ambulance. They called uh, and phew, the brother died in my arms. And, right, because I guess you were holding him. Yeah, I was holding him when he passed me. He passed in my arms. And I guess you were saying, please don't die. Of course. Keep I on mean, breathing. I thought it was a, a night. I, I really literally thought I was dreaming, but it was not a dream. So so you're, you're already realizing what, what had just happened. Yeah. And the gravity of it is starting to hit you. Crazy, yeah. The police show up. Ambulance came first. The ambulance comes. They get him and they still, they trying to work on him put him in the ambulance. I'm still sitting there. They take off with him. And next, the police came. And when the police came. Did you think to run at that point? No. Nah. No. No. Police came. They and arrested they, they arrest you. They just came and picked me up, put me in handcuffs, because other people were saying that's, you know, it was more people there. I was in a, like a state of shock. I, I was not really even there. I was, it was just unbelievable, man. I couldn't believe what was happening. So you get arrested and then you get charged. Yes, I get charged. You get a lawyer. First, I get an attorney, yes. You bail out? 
Uh, no, I didn't bail out. Oh, they, I they stayed were. in. No, I they never bailed bail? out. I had no bail. Well, why it, is that? Well, because it was um, the first the first time I had no bail, no bail. You only get a bill after you go to trial and arraignment, and then they gave me like a million and some bail. I didn't have a million and some. Well, you'd have to have a hundred thousand. Yeah. Well, I didn't right. have that at that time. Right. You know what I mean? So. I stayed up in jail when I fought my case for a year and about a month. Well, did you get a real lawyer? I got a real attorney, yeah. Okay. When I just didn't bail out. Okay. Yeah. And uh, were they offering you plea deals along the way? They offered me a plea deal. I didn't take it. Like, what did they originally charge you with? First degree premeditated murder because oh, they okay. said I went in the house. Uh -huh. And by me going in the house, that was premeditated even though it was in the heat of a of a physical altercation okay but that wasn't gonna hold they knew that i mean yeah. when i was in the police station the first thing they told me you're not gonna um do forever that's what they told me you said you gonna do some time i was like man well you know it is what it is as far as i was willing and you know i have to pay for my actions you know no matter if it's in the heat of the moment or not yeah if something happened your ass gotta had you done jail time before then? Yeah, uh, Never. not like prison time, not just real just jail, a time. Bit of jail time. Here. Just like the little issue that I had with my first okay. girlfriend. And Overnight that. kind of. Yeah, Got there it. wasn't nothing so, major. So now you're facing some actual life, real prison life. time. Yeah. You get a lawyer and you spend a year in the county yeah. fighting this case. Yeah. Right before the trial, what do they offer you as a plea deal? Um, 12 years. 12 years. 11 years plus one for the weapon, 12 years. Manslaughter. Manslaughter. But you turned it down. Turned it down. Why? Um, I guess, I don't know. I, I can't answer that question. God, I guess, didn't want me to take no deals, make no deals. Okay. So you take it to trial. I took it to trial. And it gets to the jury and the jury actually finds you guilty? Of manslaughter. Of oh, manslaughter. Not, not guilty on first degree, not guilty on second degree, guilty on um, the third, the lesser charge. Manslaughter means that someone died, but you didn't plan to kill them. It him. wasn't. It was um, someone just malice died. Malice or forethought, premeditation. Right. It was in the heat of the moment. Like, like drunk driving would something, be manslaughter. Absolutely. It so if someone dies, like if you're drunk driving, you didn't plan to kill them, but your actions caused the death, so therefore... So you held accountable. You're held accountable. Yeah. How did you feel when they told you 10 years? Well, actually, I mean, well, first you're found guilty, and then the, the sentencing comes later, right? When they, when they said not guilty on first degree murder, not guilty on second degree murder, I felt relief okay. because I knew that my intention wasn't murder. I didn't go there looking to kill nobody. Right. However, I did, you know, I wanted to be held responsible. And I knew that if I got manslaughter, God willing, I don't get first or second because that's life. Oh, so first and second is both life? Both life. Uh -huh. you ain't, I mean, you're not getting out, period. However, when I heard uh, manslaughter, I was thankful like, because I, I still have a, a opportunity, you know what I mean? And so the judge dismissed the jury, didn't allow them to um, sentence me because by law, I was supposed to um, be found, if I was found guilty, my um, sentence was to be handed down by the jury, not the judge, because I had a trial. And the judge dismissed my jury and he gave me the maximum sentence. Oh, they, the jury yeah, could have given you a lower sentence? They would, they, the max they could have gave me was seven years. Why did the judge do that? Why do the judges and do all the shit they do to us in court? So you think it was personal to a certain it, it was always It's always personal when it's, yeah. when it's a young black man in court. And, and, and but even one that's clearly an matter. asset to society, doing matter. movies that the judge may have seen and all Denzel that? Denzel wrote a letter on behalf of me. Right. Um, John Lessenhop, the director of Lockdown and Takers, he came and spoke on my behalf as a character witness, my mother. My community, my people in my community, neighbors, um, the church, hmm. pastors, people that know me came. I had so many people. It was not one. And when I say this, I mean not one person in that courtroom that was against me. 
not even from the victim's family, because the mother knew me, I, and my character, my person, the victim's mother. And no one was in there to say, you know, no, 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 not one. Were there any witnesses though that testified? It was witnesses that testified, and they all testified on my behalf. On your behalf, yeah. okay. And I but the still judge got, turned around and still gave you still the maximum. Got the maximum sentence. How did you feel when you heard the judge say ten years? Well, he said eleven. He's ten plus one. He's eleven with eighty-five percent. My family start crying and everybody. Um, but I didn't. I I felt like, man, I got to do this. Let me go do this, and that's it. I didn't. I felt relief and I felt grateful and thankful that, you know, God gave me mercy and had mercy on me and saw the, and knew the truth. And it was, it was revealed. Okay. So then you go from county to the penitentiary. To the penitentiary. And you're how old at the time? 25. Very young man. Yes. And 25 years old, you now go into the penitentiary but you're not a typical inmate. Like everybody knows who you are. Yeah. You're, you're a movie star. Were you put in PC? No. Why is that? Um, I never felt I need, who gonna protect me other than God Almighty? Allah is my only protector. So that's how I feel, that's how I felt. And I knew that. So I was like, man, if I'm gonna go through this, I gotta go through it. And I don't want to be around a gang of, uh, you know, people that got the type of jackets that's on right. people in PC. Snitches, pedophiles, yeah, I mean, dirty I'm, cops. I'm cool on all, all that. that. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I deal with the real. Okay. Yeah. So what was that experience like? Here you are, 25 years old in penitentiary, and people got, probably looking at you I like, motherfucker, why are you here? Yeah, like <laughs> I got tested, like, you know, handled. You know, people approached me, try to see if I, if I was real or, you know, a, a pushover. And I handled my business, you know, as any man would. Ain't nobody pushed me over, I can tell you that. And then did you have a group of people that you fucked nah, with? Nah, I mean, uh, certain people that I chose but not, but associate you didn't, you didn't. with, nah, nah, I ain't never paid no, um, like, for, for protection or none of that. If it, it, it was somebody that I felt was a, Compa compatible as far as character wise with me, then I chose, you know, I associated with a chosen few. However, you know, you have people that come out of, from wherever they may be from, you know, and try to test you as a man, that happens, riots, you know, that happen. And I participate, with, you know, cause I have to, and it's my people. Other than that, I'm, you know, I'm a man. If a motherfucker got issues with me, you, you can take care of that, you know. What do you think is the worst thing you experienced or, or saw or went through during those uh, 10 years? The worst experience that I saw or went through? Shit, the whole experience of just being in prison and away from your family and away from, you know, your ability to provide for your family. Right, but I mean, prison is a very violent place. It is violent. Between violent the inmates, I've seen the, all kind of, the, I, mean, I never the seen those. I never seen anything sexually um, like motherfuckers so getting no raped. Or... Nah, nah, that shit is. They be putting extras on that man. In this damn time, there's too many brothers up in here, and people that don't condone shit like that, you know. And then you got too many motherfuckers willingly giving up ass, and right. you know, like, <laughs> if you get caught doing that shit, that's that's your ass, you no, know, literally, because too many men, motherfuckers don't want to see that. Motherfuckers don't want to be around that. So, you know, that's, I, violence wise, I've seen a lot of people get stabbed. Yeah. I've seen motherfuckers get killed up in there. So, right in front of you, you saw people get killed. I've killed. seen, you know, things yeah, in I mean, the county what, jail, especially. Yeah. I mean, what is that like when you're, I mean, for a human being to be put in that level of savagery where people are, are, are getting killed in front of you, people getting stabbed in front of you, like, like that that's type of thing? That's fucking unbelievable. It's barbaric. It's yeah. like, it's, it's sad. It's so much more that can be done. Um, they could, you know, these people that have to go to prison or have to do time can benefit from, you know, in a, in a, in a real rehabilitational way. And just to throw people in cages, you know, and just say, fuck them, basically, and, you know, it's, it's terrible. Well, I guess you got your jaw broken at one point? I got my jaw broken, yeah. It's just a fight. 
And uh, um, well, it wasn't really a fight. It was somebody dope fiend. You know, they were smart. That, you know, some motherfuckers know how to get at you. And he got at me in the most intelligent way you could, because if I would have knew he was coming, he would have never broke my jaw. I can guarantee you that. When you said that prison hasn't taught me anything, it only tried to make me worse. Mm -hmm. That's basically the U.S. prison system for you. Well, at that time when I said that, was that with street gangs, media? I'm not sure. Yeah, well... At that time, it was probably 2005, and I was, um, you know, going through a lot. So, Grantland, actually. Grant, Grantland. Grantland, that's who said that. That's why I did that uh, interview with. Maybe, maybe well, maybe at that time I thought that way, however. It was a Grantland interview. Okay, well, at that time, yeah, it did make me worse, you know, because I wasn't, I wasn't, um, receptive enough to open up myself and utilize that time to make me better you know what i mean so i was i was thinking and i was i was bitter instead of saying you know and then one day my eyes opened a lot touched my heart my mind and he revealed some things to me in the spiritual and in the physical and you know i made the conscious decision to 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 go within myself and learn you know, what my purpose is truly, and, and I've, I've discovered that. So you became Muslim in prison? I'm not a Muslim. No. No, I'm not. I just, I know who I am. Okay. And it's, it's not neither here nor there as far as, I don't want to speak concerning my religion. Mm -hmm. I just know who I am. You know, and that's... I mean, how frustrating was it like, damn, I was about to do a movie with Denzel. I probably would have booked a whole bunch of other movies. And you're surrounded by people who don't even have, you know, even a small part of the potential mm. that you have. This is why I'm saying you're in there and it's like, yo. No, there's so many brothers and people in there that have so much potential. Some of the most intelligent, strong, and wisest men that I've met were in prison. And um, that's the truth. That's and the sad part is just they're trying to never let them out because they know the power that these people have mm. and the the effect that they can have on their community. So yeah, it's so it's brilliance and and, and the probably the most potential is in prison. Yeah, no, some of my best friends have done substantial prison time. Yeah. I, I feel you on that. Yeah. So you get out after ten years or eleven years? I did nine years, seven months, twenty two days. Okay. So now you're thirty five years old. Yes, sir getting out yes, sir. you missed a whole decade what year was this when you got out um 2011 okay yeah 2011 you get out of 2011 2001 to 2011 2011 yeah what changed in the world being away for 10 years like as you step Everything. outside Everything. you know cell phones now cell phone. <laughs> um just the, the 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 style of the the youth, yeah, you know, um, the music has changed. The music, the the cars, everything, man. It was just so fast. It was, you know, I was used to, you know, a lot more um, at a, a slow pace. You know what I mean? Yeah, I remember I interviewed Lil D from mm -hmm. Oakland, mm -hmm. and he did a uh, twenty twenty six years in prison. Man, it's crazy. He was the crack king of Oakland. At 18. Yeah. I go to the airport. And man, when I got to that airport and seen all these people moving around on these cell phones, if you'd have seen the expression on my face, I was in another world, man. Like, I, I was, the look, the look that was on me was like a person that you just let out of a cave. I mean, that's, that's how, how, how long I have been gone. Like, when I seen all these people on their phones with their head down texting and bumping into each other, man, it freaked me out, man. Because, because it was so, these people was moving so fast, right? And then in prison, you got to be kind, man. You got to say, excuse me if you bump into somebody, man. You, you know, you got to say, excuse me. You got to, you, gotta, you know, because it's a respect thing. 
So when I see you know you people bumping into each other with their head now, I don't wonder how they freak me out. I'm like, man, what, this is crazy. He said that was the biggest shock to him. So you know that what I'm is about. absolutely one of the shock because you have to be really you know cautious, alert, aware of your surroundings, respectful in prison because you know one wrong action or one slip up can cost you know a lot of people their lives. So people are respectful up in there and you know, slow, they, they think before they speak, you know what I mean? And, and, and before they do. But out here, a lot of people, you know, they in their phones, they don't see you, they don't, people invade your space, you know what I mean? It, it's no such thing as, you know, just courteousness, I guess you could say, and respect out here. Well, I guess before you went in, uh, when you did Lockdown, one of your co-stars, uh, Lloyd Avery, yeah. The second, yeah, he especially. played um, he played the guy who killed Ricky in Boys in the Hood. Yeah. He ended up killing two people, mm. and then went to Pelican Bay, and then got killed by his cellmate. Yeah. Um, were you guys close? I was. I knew Lloyd Avery. I um, we grew up in L.A., so I used to see him at the. Um, Venice Beach sometimes, you know, and I knew him from his work in Boys in the Hood. Um, and then we wind up working together on lockdown. That was the first time I had opp opportunity to really get to know him and meet him. And uh, he was a, a, a wonderful brother, man. He was, he was down to earth, he was cool. Called him L.A. Deuce. Um, rest in peace, you know. And uh, yeah, man, he was a, he was a good brother. So you get out, mm -hmm. and now you start getting adjusted back to society. Mm -hmm. But you're, you know, and I remember, I think I met you maybe a couple of years after you got out. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think I, you know, I approached you and I could tell that you were kind of distrustful mm -hmm. of me. Was that part of the, the adjustment time still of, of getting oh, back? I mean, probably not of you, if that's the way you felt. It wasn't unpersonal, just okay. how I am. I'm still kind of like that, you know what yeah. I mean? I don't like to invade people's space too much. And you know, I'm very like, you know, I'm a respectful person. You know, that's key with me. Yeah. It's just like I don't trust too many people. Um, you know, if I don't know them, I guess you could say. Yeah, fair enough. I didn't take it personally. Yeah, yeah. You know, it was like, okay, if you guys want to do the interview now, it's, yeah, yeah. we're gonna keep it moving. Yes, sir. Um, at what point after you get out do you start getting movie roles again? Uh, when I when I, the first when I first got out, I say I uh, I booked Rizzoli and Al's. That was the um, first audition I went on, and I started working right away. I did Rizzoli and Al's, and I booked Gangster Squad with Sean Penn and um, Ryan Gosling, and yeah. You get right back into it. Yeah, I got right back into it. Did you have an agent at that point? I did. Yeah, when I have an agent now. Okay. Absolutely. So Hollywood kind of started to embrace you again. Um, I guess you could say that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you start you start doing. You did Gangster Squad. Yes. You did, did Imperial Dreams. Imperial Dreams. You do Dope. Dope. Yes, sir. Where I guess you kind of Picked do the Stacy character. Uh, re re uh yeah like a little. Remake reboot of Stacy. He a little older now. Yeah, you know he's working at the school, and you know he's not gang banging. He's more, more. <laughs> it was a reboot, basically. Yeah, that was, that was a, updated nice. version of the wood. That's what dope is. Yeah, it was a cool movie, man. Yeah, it was. ASAP Rocky. I like it. it had a uh, yeah, and it had a, a a positive, I think a positive message in it. You know. Yeah, Zoe yeah. Zoe Kravitz. Is, yeah, is Zoe, in it. Zoe Kravitz. Um, you know? Yeah, man, it was a cool, it was a cool indie, indie film that really I think resonated with a lot of people. Yeah, Pharrell Williams executive. Pharrell produced Williams, yeah, he executive produced it. Yeah. Um. And and then you do another film with the guy from Star Wars. Yeah, Imperial Dreams. That's Imperial Dreams. Yeah. Okay, sorry, I, I forgot yeah. the name. Um, John Boyega. Yeah. 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 Was that done before Star Wars? 
Yes, we done that right before Star Wars. <laughs> that sure is. Like he blew, yeah, he, 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 he's His a budget, great actor, you know. man. He's a wonderful actor. So he's British, no right? He's British, yeah. Uh, man, but his talent is, you know, something to look out for, for certain. I mean, it's amazing how these British actors come over to America, you know, like the Idris Elbas of the world, they and you don't even know they're British until they years later. Year later, yeah. Well, and you know, this is where it's set as far as you know the, the land of opportunity, and people feel that if you can get it, if you can make it over here in American films, you know, in Hollywood, you can, you got it everywhere, and they they hungry, they doing their thing, man. Yeah. Yeah, they're they taking our jobs. Yeah, they are. <laughs> so I might have to go over there. Well, you know, I remember I talked to Wood Harris yeah, uh, Wood about Harris. this. Yeah, Wood You know, who worked with Idris on uh, on The Wire. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, he just explained to me how over there, uh, theater is more ingrained into the culture. They deserve the roles because... <laughs> no, I mean, they're, they're, they're obviously they're, great they're actors. Better, not just great, they're often better because... I, my theory on it is that they, they grow up with Shakespeare from day one. Right. So they grow up with um, uh, a poetry in, the, in, their, in their life that we don't. So these guys come in doing theater from like elementary school. That's like, probably what. Yeah, you I, see what I'm I've saying? never done theater. And that's yeah. probably what I need to do. And that's probably where they get us at, you know? If you got more um, practice in something and more, you know, you're going to be, be better at it. I never thought and I never had the desire, but now I'm uh, to do theater. Why, I don't why, know. Why not? Because it's live, I guess. Scarier, yeah. It's, uh, I think it's a little bit, because on, on set, you There's just no got to worry about this, you know, this here, and you, I really don't see that. But yeah. on there, you got the people out there. I think it'll be a challenge. I, I, I want to, I'm going to do that. Well, and then you booked my favorite show on television. Snowfall. Oh, man, bro. Uh, With John Singleton. My big brother, man. So how long ago did you book that role? I booked that role actually March 19th. Of this uh, year? This year, on my birthday. I read for yeah. John on my birthday. And, you know, I've, I've said this to Freeway Ricky Ross, and, mm-hmm. I, and I'm like, I know this is going to piss you off because he has his own issues <laughs> with mm-hmm. Snowfall and, and John, mm-hmm. John Singleton, because... The story is, I guess, loosely based on, on Freeway Ricky. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I told Freeway straight up, I'm like, this is my favorite show on television right yeah, now. Like Powerful, wonderful. My favorite show on television Snow is Flake. Snowfall. I, I, I know this is going to annoy you when I say this. I, I, I know this. I know this. <laughs> Boo! <laughs> <laughs> Have you watched it at all? Never. 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 What, what, I'm not really into fairy tales. Okay. First of all, because the story, as someone who's watched it, who's watched every episode, it is clearly the the Ricky Ross story, based on the. I'm, I'm okay. not saying okay exactly, you're right. and you're right. You're probably right, but it's all still, the way to the, the, the. There's a whole Nicaraguan contra with a with a DEA agent, you know, like the whole based on all the conversations you and I have had together. This is so they the probably watched your, your interviews too. <laughs> it probably did. Like Snowfall is just brilliant the way it's put together. Once again, with another, with another British actor <laughs> playing the lead. Yeah. <laughs> Once again, Damson. Yeah. yeah. Damson. So you booked this role. Have you had you actually met with Singleton before? Well, I um I met Singleton a couple of times um in my career early on. You know, just going going through the same um. Um, going for auditions. He came down, actually, I met him the first time on the set of The Wood. Okay. And I was filming the scene where I was at the school and I was about to beat the dude up for touching on my sister. And um, John was up there and he introduced himself to me and I was just shocked and in awe. And he was like, man, you're a great actor. Because he was watching us perform. And that was the first time I met him. You know, we never had a chance to do nothing or, um, he, work at that moment in time because I went to prison after that. Right. I mean, Singleton is Boys in the Hood, Poetic Justice, Baby Boy, Higher, Higher Learning, Learning, Shaft, Shaft, uh, Rosewood, Fast and Furious 2. Uh, um, it's, just, it's just, yeah. So I interviewed uh, Isaiah John. 
Okay, yeah. I'm who's, not, on, who's on Snowfall. Absolutely. Play and, Leon. And, right, exactly. Yeah. One of the main characters. And, and we talked about Snowfall, the similarities with um, Boys in the Hood. Mm -hmm. And he kind of explained to me, which, which makes a lot of sense, that... And, you know, when I f watched the first episode of Snowfall... I got that Boys in the Hood mm -hmm. feel mm -hmm. from it. Like with the way the cameras were panning and, yeah, and the look yeah. and feel of it. Yeah. Like I felt like this was a continuation of Boys in the Hood in a way. Right. Well, actually, this would be, if anything, this would be like a pre-Boys in the Hood because this is before crack. You know, this is before people had bars on their windows and before the neighborhoods are really bad. You know, so if anything, Boys in the Hood would have been, you know, after Snowfall, you know, when it comes to time, time-wise, you know, time era, so... Snowfall was almost like a prequel to Boys in the Hood. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, it was set right before Boys in the Hood, Boys in the Hood happened. Arrow, yeah. You know, because that's you when could crack... You could see it, yeah. yeah. That's when crack was first hitting L.A. and everything else like that. And it was just so... The show was so well done. And you could just feel Singleton's, you know, fingerprints all, all over, over it. it. The way the shots look and the way it, it feels. You know, because... I mean, think about the number of movie stars the Singleton made just from Boys in the Hood alone. Yeah. Ice Cube's first Every, role. I, Cuba Gooding went on to win yes. an Oscar. Nia Long. Nia Long. Uh, Morris Chestnut. Morris Chestnut went on to be a movie star. Uh, like, Oh, my goodness. You, uh, Omar Epps, Higher Learning. Omar, Omar Epps on Higher um, Learning. I mean, I, Janet Jackson, yeah, Janet that was Jackson. one of her first roles. Tupac. Tupac. Wow, Tyrese. Tyrese, Real yeah, life. exactly. It's like... He was a springboard to a lot of... A lot Architect, of bro. Yeah. That, he's one of the greatest men ever that I met, and, and genuine, like really. He grew up in L.A., so yeah, he had a he had a love and a, um, appreciation for our culture because he grew up in it, and he, to a point, I'm pretty sure he suffered at that time too. Yeah. Pretty sure he did, so he knew about it. So that's why he could connect and deliver these movies, Poetic Justice, Boys in the Hood. Um, and it was all based back loosely on Los Angeles, some aspect of yeah. it. So he, that shows how much he loved his, his city and we love him. Okay, so you get booked for that show. Yes, sir. What's the character that you play? Because it's, um, it's a new character. It's I a see. new character. Yeah. His name is Scully. His name okay. is Scully. And he's in, um, coming out in season three of Snowfall. And, you know, just he's a real... Real wild, um, exciting, vibrant person. You know, okay. I'm, 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 gonna, I'm gonna show out. Okay, so you get booked for that role. Yes, sir. And, and how much is Singleton actually working on this day to day? He's working every day. So every day he's yeah, on set. Yeah, he's there every okay. day. Yes, sir. Because it's executive produced by him, but I didn't. But there's an actual director. And, you have you, yeah. you have guest directors to come in. However, oh, he's okay. the he like he's the brains you know got it executive producer it's his ideas you know so okay so you book it in march and now you're working with singleton absolutely every day yes sir do you guys do the whole season complete it oh no we doing um my 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 role is a reoccurring role so right now we just i was able to work with him on the season three first episode that's what we shot I, we got more more episodes yes. to go so here you are, you're working with one of your heroes, once again, and you're, you're, you're working on an incredible TV project, Absolutely. you yeah. know, which is really up your alley anyways, I'm being so an, LA, excited. an yes. LA guy, and then you hear about the stroke. Yeah. Did, did you, was there anything about John Singleton leading up to this? Was, you know, did he seem healthy and, yeah, and everything? Yeah, he seemed healthy, seemed happy, excited. Man, normal. Everything was fine. But then you you get you get the news about well, first he he had a heart attack. Yes, I heard he had a. Um, I get the news that he was in the hospital, and he had a stroke. That's what I heard. And so I was like, I was devastated. However, I was hopeful at the same time because I'm like, okay, I know people that have had strokes and they've come out of it. Yeah. So my my thoughts were just, you know, sending positive prayers and energy and, and hoping for John's recovery. And well, and then I remember um, Taraji P. Henson yeah. and Tyrese 
they take a picture in the hospital with John. He's kind of smiling. Mm-hmm. Doesn't quite seem fully there, but at least he's conscious. Yes, yeah, it appears. So you're okay. He's going to pull Hopefully, out of it. Yeah. And then you hear he goes into a coma again. Mm. And then and then you hear that the family actually takes him off life support. Mm. And it just happens so fast. Yeah, too fast. Like, when, when you got that. I'm still not, not um, fully um, at grips with, you know, this understanding this. You know what I mean? It's too, because, it, it, you know, I just was with my brother. You know, he was talking to me and looking, we eating, we having lunch, he in my trailer, you know, reminiscing and talking about, you know, this character that he's created, that he knew growing up, Scully, you know what I mean? Just to be working with somebody as prolific and wonderful as John Singleton and and to be doing it, man, it was, it's a blessing and a dream come true and it hurts, man. It's something that, you know, I, I hate to happen, man. I mean, 51 years old, man, that, that is not very old at all. Right. I'm that, 43, that's a young man. man so. Yeah, that's eight years. Yeah, it's, that's it's not. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an actual tragedy. And I'm sure that he My got condolences a, go out to his family, his children. I mean, I, I was looking forward to another Tupac movie that he direct, that he actually directed. That's what I, you know. You know, you know I always felt the one that came out was, eh. It was cool, but it wasn't what it potentially could do. And I always was hoping that maybe he would come back, circle back around. I'm pretty and do sure he one. was too. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah, it's just unfortunate. Sad. Rest in peace. Rest in uh, peace. John Singleton, man. Great. One of the, one of the giants. You, one of Love the you, giants sir. In, uh, Thank you, sir. In movies. To your family. Thank you. Love y'all. Well, you're wearing a Crenshaw shirt right now. Yes, sir. Uh, did you know Nipsey at all? No, I never had the pleasure or the chance to meet the brother, man. But I love the brother, and it felt like I knew him because his his passing affected me more than I would have believed. You know, it's crazy, man. It's all it it the same like within a month, Nipsey, John, and you know, I'm just like I'm kind of messed up right now. Yeah, I think it affected everybody really badly, especially everyone in LA, you know, where, where, where it actually happened when, yeah. you know, most of us have come in contact with him in some way, you know, like I interviewed him, but we also would run into each other sometimes. Yes, like sir. on a YG video set or sometimes, you know, in the, in the mall in Inglewood, he would just randomly run into him mm-hmm. and he was always a good dude. he was real and he, he, was, he was a part of his community. He really, you know, loved and cared for his people. And we all know that. Everybody um, now know that even more, you know, because they could see what he was doing. However, um, yeah, that's just a tragic situation, man. Uh, and I fucking hate that that shit happened, man. I mean, when you look at that whole situation, did you ever see the tape, the video? Yeah, I saw yeah. the tape. I watched it once and couldn't, couldn't yeah. watch it again. I didn't. I can't watch it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, when you look at, you know, no one's been convicted yet, but Eric Holder. Shitty Cuz is the one that's been arrested for it. And you look at that whole situation of how it happened and allegedly Nipsey called him a snitch and he went, came back and got a gun. A situation like that, that happened so, you know, and you went through your own situation when somebody got killed. Mm -hmm. A completely different situation, Mm -hmm. no relation to it, but the one one thing in common is that someone lost their life. Mm -hmm. And it seems in both situations, it didn't need to happen. Mm-hmm. Something that could have been talked out, you know, tempers could have, could, you know, didn't need to go where they are. And you look at how quickly things escalate and people die. Well, what are your thoughts about that? Well, my thoughts about that, as far as my situation is concerned. Not quite your situation, because I don't want to, com- I'm not comparing your situation to right. Nipsey's. Well, I don't, I don't have no thoughts about the other situation because I don't know nothing about it. Yeah. And I can't go based off just my, my seeing something. You know, if I can't, um, if I don't have facts and I can't 
I can't come to an absolute answer. I can't make no judgment concerning that or speak on it. Yeah, but it's sad. It's mm. sad. And, uh, you know, and you've been to prison, and I've, I've interviewed a lot of people that have been to prison, and it's always the same story of how a split-second situation will completely not, not only change your life, but change the lives of, of other people, change mm -hmm. the lives of families. And, uh, you know, I just hope that, that people could take this, this, you know, this Nipsey situation and say, you know, don't let things escalate. Try to de-escalate situations whenever you can. Yeah. You know, that's because every, the ramifications. That's thing, though. That's yeah. what, I think we can do better as, you know, in every aspect of life. That's what we're supposed to strive to do anyway. You know what I mean? Because no one is perfect. However, you know, I think um, we could do better to de-escalate a lot of situations. Think, um, ask yourself, is it really worth it? What are the consequences? And, you know, and move accordingly. And, you know, I try to do that every day, especially now. Yeah. You know, I'm 43, so I'm more in tune with who I am and I'm more, you know, at a slower pace in my walk. You know, I'd rather walk and drink water. You know what I mean? And yeah. Well, I guess after you got out, you got arrested again and uh, had to do uh, 20 months? Yeah, I did 20 months. What was it for? Uh, carrying a knife out of concealed weapon. Carrying a knife? Carrying a, a knife on my head. Uh, yeah. But I wasn't supposed to have it. I wasn't on parole. Didn't have no, wasn't no violent. It was nothing. I wasn't on parole or anything. I mean, it's just out. They gave me 20, they gave me um, 21 months. So, but you just got pulled over and they found a knife on you? I was walking down the street. I was in like a bad environment, a neighborhood. So I keep a little protection for myself because of who I am. And it was nighttime. Well, it was like evening time. Okay. And the police just rolled up on me, searched me, found a knife, arrested me. And uh, I wind up getting charged with a... Uh, uh, ex-con carrying a concealed dirk or dagger and they gave me that's that's a real charge an ex-con ex with a dagger with a dirk or a dagger <laughs> yes sir i mean i'm sorry to laugh but it just no, sounds it no, just sounds not ridiculous that i pulled it out not i imagine i, I mean if you had a gun it. i got it like no okay. but but no just even if you have a if you're an ex-con and you have a, a knife or any kind of weapon you can be charged for so. that Pepper spray, anything? I mean, all that. All that. They got all, they got laws for that. I didn't know it at the time either. I thought yeah. by me being off parole, I had a right to carry it, but. And also you have a knife, it's not, it's well, not a gun. And, and I'm not using it. I don't, I'm not hurting nobody, threatening nobody. Yeah. You know, so what's the issue? But it was because of my prior, my past. Okay. That they, they can utilize that against you in the future. So you go back, was it in county or did you have to actually go to I prison? did, I went to prison, I did 20 months. How did you feel being back in prison for that it type was of worse. bullshit, it bullshit was worse. charge? I was disgusted. Disgusted. Sick. Like, I couldn't believe it. But I was like, I'm not gonna play with these people. I'd rather take this deal than go to trial for having a concealed dirk or dagger. Nobody there, no victim, no, and they somehow yeah, give me right. seven years. You know what I mean? Oh, that's what you were facing with no, this case? No, you're talking about 14 years for this. 14 years I for a knife? I put that on everything I love, man. <laughs> oh, they was talking man. about f for the past and two for this. and uh, That's how they do you, man. That's really how they get down in them courts. Yeah, no, I mean, I interviewed Kerry Lathan who got shot next to Nipsey that's and after doing 26 years. They after, gonna give him a they, case. For well, they were, they were trying to violate his uh, probation and give him life again. <clears throat> that's, and you know, I did the interview and I think it raised enough noise that they finally just dropped the charges yeah, and he's back home. Blessing, thank God for that. Yeah. They would they really do do that to a lot of people and get away with that shit. Yeah, well the gang affiliation. That like, the, the, that, that right there is a really scary type of rule because uh -huh. you're in the car with someone, you don't know what gang they happen to be in. Uh -huh. You get pulled over, okay, he's in a gang. You're you're not supposed to be associating with a gang member, you've just violated. Back inside. That's it. And then, you know, or you just move back home to the only family you know, and there happens to be gang members in the, in the family. And then, boom, you violate again. 
yeah, it's 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 a it's a really set of fucked up laws overall that's really kind of designed to to have a revolving door to keep people inside. Is how I look at it. It is, and it, it it is that way. However, you know, we just have to be more um, aware of the system. It's a system, you know, and a motherfucker can't circumvent the system unless you're aware that the system is against you and how to circumvent it. You know, and, and you know, I just, like I say, I, I, I think before I do now, I'm sober spiritually, mentally, you know, physically, and uh, I'm real cautious. I got a son, you know, a five-year-old son, and I wanna be in his life. I love raising him. So I'm responsible. You know, I have to be like absolutely responsible now. So I'm not making no errors, not taking no losses, no more. Yeah. Yeah. So there was a video of you crying at one point. My only purpose is to. If the police couldn't track down her daughter's killer, well, then she would. Well, I will my only purpose to be to be better, to be somebody better, to help people, to help uh, everything better, more life, more love, more peace, more. Uh, and uh, I sacrifice. With Carol often ending up parked outside. More than I can do uh, I can't sacrifice no more. Yeah. What what exactly was that about? You, well, at that point in my this is before I went and did the twenty months. Okay. So in this time in my life, man, I was struggling with alcohol addiction. And it was kinda heavy in my life. And um Actually, the 20 months is what allowed me to get sober. I've been sober for three years, almost three years now. So that allowed me to, you know, jump start and to get back into, you know, into my, to myself. And I was that was a cry for help, bro. I was going through a lot at that time, you know, just in my life, man. You know, with my family, with my, you know, my my living situation, my finances, my uh, parole. I just had so much stress and people were just coming at me and I was just like really re like trying to tell motherfuckers to leave me alone, man. Bag up, you know what I mean? Won't y'all let a motherfucker have some a peace of mind, you know, a nigga, and you know when somebody crying out for help, they don't know how to do it. And that now that I see that, I realize that's what it was, you know? It was just, I needed some help and, and you know, I got it, unfortunately, it took 20 more months of my life. Yeah. Yeah, I got it now. You got it. Yes, sir. Well, man, look, it sounds like you're on the straight and narrow. Yes, At this sir. point, it sounds like you're taking being a father yes, very sir. serious. Yes, sir. Um, you know, which is something you didn't get to experience yourself. No, I didn't. You know, you get to break that cycle. Yes, sir. I mean, you know, I don't I don't um, blame my dad because he was, he was my rock. He, you know, the time that I did spend with him, I needed that. That the love and that, that the wisdom that he shared with me. So, you know, I don't hold nothing against him. You know, I love him. I miss him now. I'm going to be better, though. I'm going to be him. You know, I'm going to do better than my dad did. Yeah. And and hopefully my son will be greater and better than I am. And that's how I want it. That's how we should all want it. That's the goal. Yes, sir. That's the goal for your kids to, to surpass what you did. Yes, sir. You know, because you help them get, get to that first step. Absolutely. You know, they, they get to the rest of the steps, man. Yeah. Well, listen, <sighs> you know, an incredible story. And, uh, you know, with the, you know, the tragedies, you, you just kind of consistently see the triumphs yes. along the way, you know, because it, it'd be very easy for you to do your 10 years and then never touch Hollywood again and just say, you know, fuck it. Go. You know. Yeah go do whatever but you came back and pursued your dreams and you're doing with like films with the star of star wars <laughs> and sorry. you know you're you're doing uh you know films like dope and yes sir you know doing films with sean penn and this is post 10 For, years yes sir 
you know, and I think that that's incredible because a lot of people, once they, they get, get into the prison system, that's it. They just go right back, yeah. you know, and although you did do a small stretch going back, I don't see that as... It was six years after, but yeah, still... Yeah, it was six years after, and it, it, and it was really, it just seems like a freak accident. It, really. was, it was just... Just something stupid. Yeah. You know? But, but to speak on that, um, we all, like, real, really, the reason that I, I could say that I made it and endured that, because I wanted something greater for myself, because I knew that wasn't my intention. I wasn't supposed to be in prison. I didn't mean, that was not my will to, for somebody to lose their life. You know what I mean? So I didn't belong there anyway, so I was gonna do everything in my power to make it out of it. And I wasn't gonna be the same that I was before I went by, because I wasn't gonna allow that to happen. So with that being understood by me and striving and wanting to get back to my dream and to my life and to produce a family and have something, that was my motivation. And when I got out and God permitted me, you know, I, I, um, I didn't hold nothing against myself, you know what I mean? I just, you know, we, we works in progress, man, and I understand that. Yeah. And that's why, it's, you know, I got it, I'm not done. I just started, man, like really, yeah. this is the new me, this is this who I am supposed to be right now. Well, I mean, and as an actor, man, you can keep doing this since your 80s, 90s. Man, you know, me. like like I said, I just interviewed Bill Duke. He's 76 years old. And wow, he's still he's still doing you know films like right now he's working on a film as we speak. He'll do you man. know Predator, man. <laughs> Predator, man. Commando, Commando, real Deep life, Deep Cover, Deep Action cover, Jackson, Action Jackson, all that. Uh, car wash. My, speaking of Action Jackson, this is my brother Action Jackson. We got a movie <laughs> we doing right now. Okay. You know what I mean? And my other brother, we working on um, a documentary, yep. and you know a little food like a food reality show. Okay. For diabetics. Okay. You know. I dig it. Yes. Sir. I like it. Well, listen, man, DeAndre Vons, man. Like I said, I'm a big fan. And at the end of the day, you're already sitting on a body of work that's yeah. timeless in our cult classics, you know, from from the wood to, you know, the Tales from the Hood to, to a lot of very dope films, man. And and you're still doing it. You're still getting roles. Mm, you still God, you still are man. doing your thing, man. So I'm just looking forward to what else you got coming up, man. Hey man, I think you, you have a lot. You, I do, man. You, you're gonna be surprised. You know, I got some music out there too. That's you can up. check me out um, on Facebook. I mean, Instagram at DeAndre Bond, D E A U N D R E B O N D S. And um, I just want to give a shout out to my family, my brothers, uh, Dank, Oncoming Traffic. You know, my brother Pac, man, something out of nothing, grind till we rich. You know how we do it, man. Uh, my brother Action, let's make this wow happen. You already know, bro, Action Jackson. Hey, thank you, Vlad, man. I appreciate the- uh, No doubt, man. Thank you for coming through. Until next time. Yes, yeah, sir. Andre Bonds, man.